In the interwar period, the Germans endured the bitter consequences of the Treaty of Versailles imposed by the victors, but that didn't mean they would willingly comply. In truth, the German military kept looking for loopholes and tricks to rebuild its glorious power as the years passed, and one foolproof way to continue with its U-boat engineering legacy was to create a secret corporation. Based in the Netherlands, NV Ingenieurskantor for Schapesbau was a dummy company that, as early as the 1920s, researched and developed the submarines that would roam the Atlantic 20 years later. Despite the limits that bound them, nothing would stop the Germans from bulking up their fleet well before World War II broke out. Apparent Peace On June 28, 1919, Europe finally found peace, but it came at a high cost. The Allied powers gained the upper hand and compelled Germany into signing the Treaty of Versailles, but the defeated party would resent it as a terrible humiliation. Germany and its military would endure strict limitations for the better part of two decades, suffering the restrictions imposed on them by the victors. In particular, the Reichsmarine was banned from building or even developing submarines, but the German Reich still looked for creative ways to circumvent the system. With no intention to comply with the severe measures, the German Navy found a way that allowed them to continue with their World War I Unterseeboot legacy. As such, they established a dummy company in The Hague, Netherlands, which was basically a facade organization to conduct secret activities and continue researching and developing submarines throughout the interwar period. Operating since 1922, the head office of NV Ingenieurskantor for Schapesbau, Dutch for Engineer Office for Shipbuilding, reportedly operated three German shipyards, AG Vulkenstetten in Stetten and Hamburg, the Krupp-owned Germania Werft in Kiel, and AG Weser in Bremen. Hiding behind the organization, the German Sea Service could continue designing submarines without interruption. Working around the political intricacies, and avoiding drawing too much attention to their actual purposes. Perhaps more importantly, the foundation of the IBS company directly impacted the future of Europe. Unknowingly, the Germans had taken the first step in creating the Kriegsmarine. Play along. The German military was bound by the international agreement that demanded all U-boats be destroyed or given to other nations. Left without proper submarine capability, IBS would discreetly bypass the treaty, continuing where they left off in World War I. The pretend company first designed two submarines, based on the Imperial German Navy's UB-3, built in a shipyard in Rotterdam in 1927, and to play along with the international compromises, the vessels were sold to Turkey. The next ship was built three years later, Initially contracted by the Spanish Navy, Submarino E-1 was constructed in Cadiz, Spain. Notably, however, she would double as a prototype of a German vessel, the Type 1. The Spanish Navy eventually lost interest in the development, and the submarine was also sold to Turkey. However, the story attracted the attention of a new customer, the Soviet Navy. Soon, the E-1 morphed into the E-2 project, and the first two prototypes were built albeit with significant modifications. The following spring, a third prototype came along and inspired the Soviet S-class of submarines. Further adjustments were made to ensure the entire production of the class used less expensive Soviet-built equipment. Meanwhile, Type 1 became the first post-World War I attempt to produce an ocean-going submarine for the future Nazi Kriegsmarine. Only two models were built, despite their moderate success but it was more likely due to political decisions than any significant faults in the machinery. Even so, Type 1 would not be the company's most prominent development. Devil in Disguise As the National Socialist Party gained strength in Germany in 1933, the Reichsmarine established a training school in Kiel for U-boat crews, the Submarine Defense School program provided cover for a small fleet of eight 500-ton submarines, which was later doubled to 16. 
The lessons were purely theoretical at first, but with the fainting of restrictions stemming from the newly empowered Nazi regime, Reichsmarine personnel got easy access to first-hand information about the most recent submarine developments through the dummy company and the training school. Now that the government openly supported a renovated program, construction work began for a fleet of underwater ships that were smaller than previously estimated. The first batch of 250-ton U-boats was assembled at the Deutsche Werk shipyard in Kiel, behind the cover of a construction hall. In the meantime, the newly elected government was seeking a more favorable agreement with Great Britain and needed to disguise the filthy details of its deceitful operations. But everything changed in 1935 after Adolf Hitler accelerated the pace of rearmament. On June 18th, the Führer realized the world would most definitely see through his intentions and reached an agreement with the British. From then on, the German Navy was allowed to build a fleet up to 35% the size of the Royal Navy when it came to surface vessels. However, they could equal the British in the number of submarines. Eleven days later, the first submarine built for the Kriegsmarine was commissioned. Theory and Practice Along with her five younger sisters, U-1 formed the fleet of the so-called Anti-Submarine School. Later on, several variants would bulk up a fleet of 60 ships until the early years of the war, but in contrast to other models, few examples were lost, as they were primarily used as training boats. After the sudden halt in Type 1 production, a new design branched out from the accumulated knowledge of German engineers. It was the Type 7, which became the standard German U-boat model in World War II. Somewhat inspired by earlier iterations going back to their Type UB-3, no less than 703 Type 7 models would roam the Atlantic during the war. Moreover, German crews would have an advantage over other navies at the outbreak of the war, actual combat experience. Many early submarines acquired valuable experience operating from Spanish ports during the Civil War, and some of the most famous commanding officers were forged before World War II even broke out. By June of 1939, the German High Command had already defined the strategy for the invasion of Poland. Prior to the attack that initiated the war, the submarine fleet sailed towards Polish ports with the objective of impeding the local Navy's escape to the North Sea, though some escaped to friendly countries. Then, in solidarity with the Poles, Britain declared war on Germany. Who's to blame? The declaration of war came as a surprise to many German commanders, but there was no going back. For one, Captain Lieutenant Fritz Julius Lemp, commander of the Type 7 U-30 submarine, was rattled by the news. But as the German High Command expected to deter France from going to war, Admiral Karl Dernitz ordered that all commanders should operate within prize rules. Hence, passenger ships should not be sunk, and only ships that posed a threat could be attacked without warning. That afternoon, Lemp spotted a ship advancing on a defensive course and an unusual route, and he assumed it was a British armed merchant. He then fired two torpedoes, with only the second striking home. The U-boat immediately dived for protection, but Lemp fired a third torpedo upon resurfacing, which missed the target. Suddenly, U-30 intercepted a distress call from the British ocean liner SS Athenia. The cruise ship carried 1,400 passengers, and Lemp suddenly realized what he had done. Within a day, the news about the transgression against civilians spread across the globe, but the German leadership decided to keep the secret, denying any implication in the event. In fact, the propaganda ministry turned the tables on the British, arguing that one of their own torpedoes sank Athenia in a pitiful effort to drag the United States into the war. The U-Boat Peril British Prime Minister Winston Churchill correctly assessed the threat of the German U-boats, especially regarding the Atlantic lifeline. As Britain's center of gravity, losing such a critical line could mean wholesale defeat. If Germany managed to prevent merchant ships from carrying food, raw materials, troops, and other supplies from North America, it would directly affect the war's outcome. Had the Allies not been able to cross the North Atlantic, neither Britain nor America would have been able to project their land forces in the Mediterranean theaters, 
let alone for D-Day. It was the Prime Minister who named the effort the Battle of the Atlantic, as that waterfront was Hitler's best hope of defeating the British Empire. During World War I, Germany had executed a similar campaign and came too close to defeating Britain in 1917. Nevertheless, Germany underestimated the impact of its U-boats years later and prowled the Atlantic mainly with service vessels as World War II approached. Even so, it was a submarine that sank Athenia, marking the beginning of the Second Battle of the Atlantic. And even though the truth would not come out until Dernitz admitted it at the Nuremberg Trials, the war had already begun. As Churchill once admitted, quote, the only thing that ever really frightened me during the war was the U-boat peril. Thank you for watching our video. If you enjoy watching Dark Seas, please give us a thumbs up and make sure to check out the rest of our Dark Documentaries channels. Also, don't forget to hit the bell icon to be notified about our latest content on military history and technological developments. Stay tuned.